data, one of the youth services librarians here. And remember, we're doing this every Tuesday at 2 o'clock until 3 at the different, different programs every week. But you go to the website to sign up. Um, and this is a work in progress, you know, like everything else is these days, right? And so just keep your eye on our website. We'll tell you about how things change. I don't know if it'll ever get to the point this summer where we don't have to limit, but we'll see. This is Meredith. Hi guys. Um, how are you guys? Hot? I'm pretty sweaty. Um, we'll get through it. Um, I'm here from the Humane Society of Western Montana. Does anybody know what a Humane Society is? Shout it out. Give me some answers. Anyone? Humane Society, yeah. You did the same program? That's pretty cool. Any guesses what a Humane Society does? Yeah. Yeah. Takes care of animals until they can find a new home. That is a great answer. Um, that is what one part of what we do. It's the animal sheltering portion. So we run an animal shelter, which has anybody visited our animal shelter? Maybe adopted an animal before? No one? You guys? You guys? Awesome. You guys too? Oh my gosh. So many animal lovers out there. That's awesome. So we run adoptions out of our building, which is just south of town towards Lolo. Um, we adopt out about 1,500 animals a year, give or take, um, which is a fair amount for a community our size. Missoula really loves animals, and it's a super fun place to work. Um, we do a different part of the shelter, too. Instead of just animal sheltering, we also run an animal resource center, which is a complicated way of saying we help people who have pets. It's pretty hard to help pets without helping their people. I can't really go up to a dog and say, hey, you, take this medication and also get neutered. It's not going to happen very well. We have to tell the people, hey, sir, you should get your dog to take this medication and you should take him to get neutered. That's the way we have to help, help pets is by helping their people, which is actually a pretty fun job because I get to come and talk to you guys. We got some pet owners out there. Who has a pet at home? Whether or not it came from the Humane Society. Oh my gosh, that's literally everyone. Every one of you guys has a pet at home. So cool. Uh, so on our staff, we have me, myself. I'm our outreach coordinator, so I do education. I help our volunteers. Uh, but I also work as a vet tech, which is like a nurse, but for veterinarians. So I help the veterinarians do all of the stuff that they don't have enough hands to do, uh, which is a pretty fun job. It's really dirty, but it's really fun. We have two vets who work for us full time, two veterinarians. Does anybody here want to be a veterinarian when they grow up? Maybe a couple? Yeah. It's a pretty cool job. You got to be ready to go to a lot of school, though. So, I see you guys get good grades. Uh, but it's really, really awesome. Do you guys have any idea what our vets might do the most of at the Humane Society? Shout it out there if you got an idea. Let me hear it. Any guesses? Help pets, totally, yeah. So if you guys take your pets to the vet, they probably get shots, right? That's not very fun, but we've all got them. Yeah. Um, and they might get surgery, and maybe they get some medication, but they also help you just know more about your animal. How do we keep them happy? How do we keep them healthy? That's the job of a veterinarian, is to help you guys, help pet owners, take better care of their pets. So our vets at the shelter do that for our shelter pets, but we also do it for our entire community. The whole town of Missoula has pets, and some people really need help taking care of them. And our vets do a lot of surgery. They do what's called spay and neuter surgeries. Any idea what that might be? You want to tell us? Yeah. I might know what neuter is. Okay. I think that's absolutely right. We can do that to dogs and cats. Neuter is when it's a boy and spay is when it's a girl. And either one is a surgery where we take the organs they use to make more babies and we take them out so that they can't have any accidental babies. Because that's why there's so many pets in our country, is because they just keep having accidental babies. And if we can stop that from happening, then we won't even need places like the Humane Society because there won't be any unwanted pets. That's our goal, the dream. We'll see if we ever get there. But what we do to work towards it is we have our vets do spay neuter surgeries. And I actually have a lot of the stuff we use for that over here. At the end of our little lecture, you guys can walk around. You can uh, put your hands in the blind boxes. You can see if you can tell what's inside them. Nothing gross, I promise. 
but I do have some stuff that might be a little gross back here if anyone wants to look. Any of you future vets out there, if you want to see something pretty interesting, I can show you. Uh, but we've, also, we've got these guys over here. Do you guys have any idea what these are for? These are for surgery. These are the tools, the actual tools our vets use to do surgery on all our animals. Yeah, all the little things. So when we are done, you guys can come over and touch them and play with them and give them a peek. Uh, our vets do probably about 1,000 to 2,000 spay-neuter surgeries a year, which is a lot. And that's more than I said we adopt out, right? That's more animals than are in our shelter. So what we do is we have a big RV-looking thing, a giant bus, and we drive it all over the half of the state, all over the western half, and we go to places where there are no vets, like really rural communities. We go to places where there are too many pets, like reservations or places where people have let their farm dogs or farm cats get out of control. And we just swoop in in our mobile vet unit and we spay and neuter and spay and neuter for three days straight and then head out again. And doing that, we get to do like a thousand more animals than we would see just through our, our clinic. So I have a coloring sheet for you guys too. When we're all done, you can color our mobile veterinary unit. It's called the vaccinator. It couldn't come for a visit today because it's helping some cats right now. But you might see it around town. We're going to be at Pet Fest later this summer with the vaccinator, as well as at our summer event, which is in a couple weeks called the Firstival. Um, it's at Fort Missoula. If anybody's looking for something fun to do, July 11th, the summer festival. Um, the vaccinator is going to be there as well as face painting and uh, dog training demonstration, all kinds of fun stuff out at Fort Missoula. So let's get back to our veterinary stuff and our first aid because that's what you guys are here to talk about. Uh, our vets do a lot of spay neuter surgery, but we also help pets when they come in. If something's wrong with them, like they've got porcupine quills, we'll yank those out. If they've got cuts, we'll stitch those up, things like that. But there's a lot you guys can do at home to recognize problems with your animal before they become big emergency problems. So we're gonna talk about how to do first aid with your animals at home, probably using mostly our demonstration dog over there. Her name is Chug. Great. So the first stage of knowing when something's wrong is knowing when something's wrong. We look at Chug and we're like, oh, how's Chug doing? You think she's healthy? How could we possibly know? We look at three different things. We call them the vital signs. And it goes T, P, R. Can you guys do that? T, P, R. T, P, R. Any guess on what the T stands for? Teeth? No. Temperature. Ugh. That one's a really, really important one right now because if you might not have noticed, it's really hot outside. So the first one we wanna look at if, to see if an animal is sick is their temperature. Uh, now, I bet you guys have all been to the doctor and they do the little, little digital thermometer to tell what temperature you are. Has anyone ever had that happen? Yeah. Do you think we can do that on dogs and cats? No, they've got too much fur. Maybe on like one or two that are totally naked, but most dogs and cats like Chug, we can't do that. So I hate to tell you, do you guys know how we take their temperature? Do you? In their butt. In their butt, yeah. So we are not gonna practice that today, okay? But we do that, but, did you guys hear that? No. <laughs> Uh, we do that with a normal thermometer, just like this. This is my um, demonstration first aid kit that we're going to be going through while we do this. Uh, we do that just with a normal thermometer. We just make sure it's a separate thermometer than anything we might use for the people. <laughs> uh, so when we check out their temperature, it's going to be a little bit hotter than what people are normally at because dogs and cats are a little bit smaller than us. And usually, the smaller you go, the hotter you get. And the bigger you go, the colder you get in animals. That's usually how it works. So dogs and cats, if they were humans, they would always have a fever. But it's normal for them. It's still really easy for them to get too hot, though. Has anyone ever heard of that happening? Maybe? Do you guys know the number one reason dogs and cats get too hot? A lot of fur. That does not help. If you've ever seen a husky out in the summer, whew, I do not want to be that dog. That does not sound like very much fun. Any reason uh, like a, why an accident might happen that they get too hot? God, you got all the answers. 
That, that can unfortunately happen if they actually get too hot. The number one reason why they get too hot is usually that they get left in a car and the windows aren't open enough, or even if they're open all the way, the car's like a little oven and it heats up and heats up and heats up. And dogs and cats, I don't know if you know this, they can't sweat. We cool off by getting really sweaty and gross and the air and the heat evaporates our sweat away and that cools us down. That's how people and horses and pigs and a couple other animals, that's how they cool down. Do you guys know how dogs and cats cool down? They pant <laughs> because the water on their tongue evaporates, but they can't sweat through all that fur. So they have to use their tongue to pant and cool down. They can also sweat through their paws. That's a cool one. So if you ever have a, like a hot cat or a really nervous cat and they walk around on a table, they leave sticky little paw prints. We see that all the time at the shelter. They come in like, oh no, this is a scary place. And they got cute little cat paw prints. So um, I have a little experiment for you guys. I'm gonna come around if anyone is willing to participate in my experiment and I'm gonna put a little bit of alcohol on your arm, okay? And I want you guys to blow on it, okay? Anyone wanna participate? You down? Okay. And blow on it. You gonna try? Awesome. Give it a shot. You wanna try? Okay. Give it a blow. Just blow some air on it. You wanna try? Oh, I won't put on your cut. That would be terrible. You wanna give it a shot? Let's give it to you guys. You want to try too? Thank you. You too? Okay, awesome. Thank you. Okay, everyone, blow on your little alcohol spot if it's still even there. Does that skin get hot or does it get cold? Cold! That's evaporation. Did you miss one? Do you want? I feel like it's a little bit of both. It feels like freezing, but at the same time, it's so hot. It's so hot. Your breath is pretty hot too. Sometimes it'll heat up the area around it, but that one spot's going to get cold. And that happens because that water, the alcohol, as it evaporates away, it pulls the heat with it. So we're gonna learn our first first aid tip. It's gonna be what to do if you find a dog that's too hot. So we've checked her temperature, it's too hot. She's panting, we know she's in trouble. We're gonna take alcohol, which is in our first aid kit. Oh. And we just put it on the places that their body is able to sweat, which is their paws. So quick, we think Chuck is in trouble. Oh my gosh, she's too hot. Get her out of the car. We gotta get to the first aid kit. Okay. And then we're gonna open our alcohol and just put on her paws and we can either blow on it, just like you guys did, or put a fan in front of her. Do you guys know the third thing, the, the last thing you always need to do when you have to do this with a dog? Call your vet. You gotta make sure you get your dog to the vet because you did the first aid part they have to do the rest of it. It's just like, if you have to do this for a person, if you have to help a person, you gotta call 911. Calling 911 for an animal means taking them to the vet. You guys did so great. We saved Chug. Look, she's awesome. She's back on her feet. Good work. Well, she's mostly back on her feet. <laughs> there, she, there, she's great. She's doing great. Fantastic. Yeah, some fumes. She's doing great. A normal temperature for a dog is up to 102.5 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty hot. If that was a person, you would definitely have a fever. If your animal is squirmy and not cooperating, if you can get them just to sit in front of a fan. That'll help too, because remember, they can also lose heat through their mouth. So if you can put that fan right there and they pant into it, that's also going to help them lose heat all great ways to cool down an animal. But remember, anytime you think your dog has gotten too hot, or cat, they do the same thing, too hot and you need to start cooling them down, you also need to take them to the vet. Yeah. Um, do you guys have any questions on temperature? Our first one of the three? Yes. The same thing, up to 102.5. But fun fact, cats can actually get a lot higher when they're stressed. When they get themselves really worked up and nervous, they can get up to 104, and that's pretty normal for them. A 104 temperature in a person is hot. That's like you're in the hospital hot. 
They can also sweat a little bit in the nose, but the nose is actually, there's not a lot of blood flow in there. So it's just cooling down that skin and that skin alone. When you cool down the other parts of your body, you're cooling down the blood too, and it helps move that cold blood through your body. The nose doesn't have enough to really do much of a difference. Plus, if you put alcohol directly on a dog's nose, they will sneeze it off really quickly. <laughs> alcohol is smelly. So we've got T. T's done. What about P? Any guess? This one, they're getting harder as we go. P. Pause. Pause. That's a good one. It's for pulse. Do you guys know what a pulse is? Yeah? It's your heartbeat. Yeah. So what you're looking for is you want to know, is it fast? Is it slow? Is it like boom, boom, boom? Or is it like, ah, ah, ah? And on people, we can practice this on us. We also have a tool. Does anyone know what tool we use to listen to our heartbeat? Shout it out. Just give me an answer. A stethoscope. Totally. Um, you guys can practice with stethoscopes if you would like to listen to your own heartbeat or your parents' heartbeat or something. Uh, but we can do it without even listening. Our pulses, our easy ones to find on people, are right here and right here. So. You might need a little bit of help, but I think these ones are the easiest. And you're feeling for it going boo, 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 boo. Right here. You've got one on each side. It's pretty cool, right? So every boo that you feel is your heart squeezing once. People usually have that, I don't know, I'm not a human doctor, 50 to 100 times a minute. Um, and dogs have it a little bit more. They're up to 120 beats per minute. So that's like two per second is pretty normal for a dog. So on us, you feel it here. You feel it here, but you can also put your hand over your heart sometimes and feel it too. And in dogs, we use the exact same spots. They're just a little harder to find. Like a dog's heart, get out of the way, Chug, is right here. So we would hold onto the dog like this. Like, okay, Chug's heart is definitely beating, totally. Um, we can also feel her pulse right here, and we can even feel the same pulse back here, but it's a lot harder. We usually go for the pulse that's covered by a muscle in people right here. This one, you probably can't find on yourself, but on a dog right here, pretty easy to find. It's not too bad. Their muscles go like this, not like this, like people's do. So when you need to feel for the pulse, the second one, we go here, here, or here, which is pretty much the same as doing this one. So what do you guys think we do? We felt it. Do we just call it good? For like, cool, her heart's beating, bye. No, we gotta count it. So we don't wanna sit and count for an entire minute, like, oh my God, it's taking a long time. We only count for like 10 seconds, and then we have to do some math, which isn't super fun, where I'm not gonna make you guys do math. This is the summer. We're not gonna bother with that. But the goal is to figure out how many times per minute Chug's heart is beating. Cool. What do you guys think might make a heart go too fast? Any guesses? Exercise, absolutely. Exercise makes our hearts go faster too. What about um, something else that might make their heart go really fast? Stress, stress? Mm, buzzword right there, nice. Um, stress, so like feeling uncomfortable or anxious or upset can all make their heart go fast, which includes feeling pain. So if a dog is hurting, their heart rate is gonna be higher, which is really helpful because they can't say, oh no, Meredith, my paw hurts. But if her heart rate's really high, I think, oh, maybe she might be in pain. What, did you have something to add? Running. running, yes, that'll make your heart rate go really high. So if your dog has been out running around all like crazy and you feel their heart rate, it's gonna be way faster than if you did it while they were asleep. Any ideas on stuff that makes their heart rate really low? The other direction. Being lazy, sleeping. Um, cooling, off. cooling off, just like, oh, this is terrible, it's so hot out. Relaxing, Relaxing. those are all times when our heart rate is a lot slower. Um, but if we're sick, our heart rate can also be a lot slower if, uh, we don't, if we've been bleeding a lot and we don't have enough blood to go through our body. Uh, that is the reason we, our heart can be slower. Also, if we're in shock. So if our body has been th through something so scary that it's shutting down, then our heart rate will be really low. So if a dog gets hit by a car and their heart rate is like, buh, 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 super slow, we gotta take them to the vet right away because that's really scary. Something bad might be happening inside. So we've checked our heart rate 
Maybe we think something's a little concerning. What should we do next? Take her to the vet. You're totally right. Spoiler, that's going to be the answer for a lot of them. <laughs> Get ready. Uh, all right. Any questions on P, pulse? Awesome. You guys are so easy. R is our third one. T-P-R. This is a hard one. It's a weird word. It stands for respiration. Anyone know what respiration is? Breathing. Breathing. Totally. Every time you inhale or exhale, you're respiring. So we do the exact same thing we do for the heart rate, um, but you sometimes don't even have to feel. You can just look and watch a dog or a cat breathing. It's pretty easy. Um, you can also hear breaths with a stethoscope. You can hear the actual sound of the air moving through the lungs, which is pretty cool. And you guys can practice on yourself, too, if you'd like to. Um, any idea what might make breathing go super fast? <laughs> Running outside, totally. Being super hot, yeah. They might not be related to exercise at all. Maybe they're just really hot. They're trying to cool off. Riding a bike, Riding a bike that would definitely get my breathing going fast. That's for sure. Uh, any other ideas why they might breathe really quickly? Dog races. Dog races, that'd be cool too, yeah. Um, same things with the heartbeat. If they're really stressed, they can start panting. If they're really painful, they can start panting. All of those things are reasons why they might go up enough that they start <sighs> really panting. Uh, the slowest time that we're breathing, anyone know? The slowest breaths. Relaxing. Relaxing, when you're asleep. When you're dead asleep, that's the slowest you ever breathe. Totally asleep. So those are the three things. Let's shut them out. T, temperature. P, pulse. R, respiration. So if you ever think an animal might be sick, those are the three things to start by looking at. Temperature, pulse, respiration. Uh, but there's a lot of other stuff that can go wrong. Any idea on other things that might be like, oh my gosh, take them to the vet immediately, emergencies. They're bleeding? Absolutely. Um, do you guys go to the emergency room every single time you cut yourself? No, gosh, no. I have a paper cut like from this morning. I didn't go to the ER. But if this paper cut was bigger than, how, how big do you think before you need to go to the emergency room? Anything about as long as your thumb or longer probably needs stitches, OK? If it's longer than your thumb, got to go to the ER. That cut would definitely have to go to the ER. I saw that one. That's a scary one. <laughs> Um, if it's deeper than your thumb, you definitely no need to go to the ER. So thumb long, thumb deep, those are bad cuts. Even if they're not bleeding, they still might need some help. Do you have a bad cut? I see that one. Gushing blood. That's actually a great word. I'm glad you said that. Because even if it's a tiny cut, if it doesn't stop bleeding for five minutes, got to do something about it. That's a cut that's not going to stop on its own. We have all kinds of amazing parts of our blood that help us clot it up and make scabs so that we stop bleeding. And if it doesn't do it in five minutes, something's wrong. So you need some help to get that one to stop bleeding. Yes. Um, one time my friend also, like, we went to a lake. He, he smashed his hand on a rock. Ooh. Ooh, yeah. That does not sound like fun. Bleeding is... Not always an emergency, like we said, I have a paper cut, but something definitely to be careful about because it can get pretty bad. Um, any other things that might, you guys are like, that's an emergency? Maybe a paper cut all the way across my pinky. A paper cut, all, like a paper cut through your pinky? Cut just, pink finger comes right off, that would definitely be an emergency. A broken, bone. a broken bone, absolutely. Have you guys ever seen a broken bone in real life? It's really gross. Imagine if you had, Chug kind of looks like she already has some broken legs. Uh, but imagine where her leg should be straight. Suddenly it's like that. Ooh, that's no good. That definitely needs to go to the vet right away. Uh, what about vomiting? Do you guys go to the doctor every single time you vomit? Every time you puke? No. But have you ever had to go to the doctor because you puked too much? Yeah, that can happen. So our rule of thumb is if you vomit, if your pet vomits, not a human doctor. If your pet vomits for more than 24 hours, 
one day of vomiting, got to go to the vet. That's when we pro think something probably is wrong in there. Um, the other one, this is going to be kind of a gross one. Get ready. If your pet cannot pee or poop on their own for more than 24 hours, that's an emergency. It's pretty common. One of the most common problems we see at the emergency room for cats is that their little pee pee gets stuck and their bladder fills up with urine. So they're, it's going to just keep filling up and keep filling up until it has a really big problem. So pee or poop, no pee or poop for 24 hours, that's an emergency. Uh, any other ideas on what might constitute like a big deal, a big first aid deal? Yeah? An infected cut, totally. If it's like, should be red, but it's green, that's a problem. God go to the vet for that too. This is only for those poor people who have to be the poopers. But if the poop changes dramatically, that is a great one. Our dog, the signal is something wrong inside. Like for a couple of days, it's not right. Yep. Uh, so normally your poop should look kind of like soft serve ice cream, maybe a little um, more like a candy bar. But if it's getting into soup territory, got to go to the vet. If it looks like raspberry jam, got to go to the vet. Told you it was going to be gross, guys. <laughs> Told you. I warned you. Um, so I have, let's see, we've got a first aid kit up here. I'm going to go through the rest of it. And you guys can tell me what you think we might need to use it for. I'm going to set my friend Chug down, though. She's not very good at first aid. Uh, so we talked about our thermometer. We talked about our alcohol. That's pretty much the only time that you use alcohol in a first aid kit. Have you guys ever gotten alcohol in a cut or hangnail or anything? Ouch! It's terrible. It hurts so bad. Um, we do have peroxide in our first aid kit. Do you guys know what we use peroxide for? You can use it to clean stuff, but in dogs, we use it to make them throw up when they've eaten something bad. So like chocolate rat poison. Um, my dog recently ate three corn cobs, and I knew those were not going to make it all the way through the other end. Those had to come out the same end they came in. Uh, and peroxide can help make them throw up whatever gross thing they just ate. Um, that's definitely something to talk to your vet to figure out how much to give your pet, but it's a good one to have in your first aid kit. Yes. Grapes, we have to make them throw up if they eat grapes, if they eat macadamia nuts. Oh my gosh, there's a long list. Avocado. Um, I had a dog eat a fishing, like, a fishing hook one time. All kinds of stuff. Um, this is one you guys will get to practice with today. Because what do you think we use this for? Yeah. Wrapping their legs, yeah. So over where Chug was to start with, we've got some materials over there. You guys can pull them apart, practice wrapping up Chug, practice putting some Band-Aids on her. We also have gauze to go underneath because this isn't going to do a whole lot. This is like the brown part of a Band-Aid with none of the white part of the Band-Aid. We have to put the white part in ourselves for animals like that. Uh, we also have tweezers in our first aid kit. Any idea? This, these are very relevant right now. Do you know what we use these for? Inside, okay, that, yeah, totally. Ticks. Oh my gosh, we went on a spay neuter trip two weeks ago, and do you guys know how many ticks we pulled off? 356. Yeah, uh huh. Yeah, lots of ticks out there right now. These are an important one. Um, we also have a syringe, and you guys will get to take home your own syringe for your own first aid kit that you can get started today. You guys know what we might use this for? It's got a lot of purposes. Uh, we can use it to give our peroxide when our dog needs to throw up. We can also fill it up with clean water to flush out a wound. If we've got a cut and there's dirt in it, you can use this to push water into it and help clean it out. Very useful. Yeah. Um, Gross. You need both of these. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that must have been a serious splinter. Ooh, you don't come at me with the scalpel. Um, we also, in case we did get a cut, we got the, the big dirt, maybe the tweezer, the splinters out. We also need something to clean that cut. Um, we recommend iodine. So I've got some iodine in my first aid kit. Uh, I've got some medical tape in case I need to tape something down or like put an extra little bit on my bandage. 
Um, I've got gloves, which I probably should have put on well before I started with working with Chuck. As soon as I started talking about this, I should have put some gloves on, am I right? Uh, we've got more big gauze in case we have a really big wound. Uh, and then I've got this guy. Any idea what I might use this for? Collar. A collar, yeah. Were you going to say a leash? Totally. If Chug is running around and I'm like, oh, crap, I need her to hold still, instantly I've got a leash. I can also, though, let's say she broke her leg. She was, like, panting. She was really, really painful. And I was like, Chug, I love you, and I know you love me, but I know you hurt really, really bad right now, and I don't want to get you in trouble. I can also make it into a muzzle so that she can't get herself in trouble by biting me. Because no matter how much your dog loves you, if their like leg is broken and they think you're going to hurt them worse, they might still bite you. So we use this exact kind just to put over their face like that so they can't bite. You guys will also get to take home your very own slip lead for your first aid kit. Rainbow. There's a bunch of colors. Not enough for everybody. Everyone has to pick one color. Um, what else is in here? Ah, one of the most important things. This guy is in the workbook, and I have a couple extra copies just in case we were to run out of workbooks or anything like that. Um, it's not very helpful. Do you guys remember? It's, it's the, the answer I told you guys. When you're done doing the first aid, you need to do something. What's the final thing you have to do? Go to the vet. It's not very helpful if you don't know who your vet is or who to call or where to go or when they're open. So we included a form that you guys can fill out with your parents about your pet's information and your vet's information that can go in your first aid kit so that when something happens, everyone knows who to call, when they're open, and what to do, in, like when to call in an emergency. That's probably the most important thing. We also have our list of what should be in our first aid kit, which is also in our workbook. So any questions about what's in my first aid kit? What I do with any of it? Awesome. Um, this will also be sitting out. Feel free to poke through. You can sniff the alcohol or stretch this guy, whatever you want to do. I don't care. Uh, you guys will get to make your own first aid kit with the start. You've got some gloves. They're pretty big for kid size, but they'll do the job. We've got syringes. Uh, and we've got slip leads for you guys to put inside your super high-tech First aid kit, yeah, uh-huh. Um, and I've got tape and markers and scissors if you need an extra copy of the pet profile where you can put all the information or the list that's supposed to go in your first aid kit or if you just want to poke through mine and see what's in there. I also have some non-first aid kitty stuff you can put in there like information about the shelter and a summer sticker. Yeah, uh, and then our other station right here, our veterinary station, uh, if you guys are interested in being vets, I saw a couple of you. Uh, these are some touchy-feely boxes. You can stick your hand in the front and feel what's in there and see if you can guess what instrument or tool or veterinary object that is. I have some stethoscopes you can try out. You can also touch and feel and poke all over this um, surgical kit, which is pretty fun. This is legitimately an actual surg surgery pack that we use at the shelter. And any brave souls that are out there, I have some gross stuff in here that you guys can come look at. It's pretty cool. Um, third station, right behind these gentlemen right here. I'm going to put Chug back there. Just in case there were an emergency, it's important to practice bandaging and carrying your dog out. If your dog broke a leg, what if they're 150 pounds? I bet you don't weigh 150 pounds. You'd have a lot of trouble carrying her out. So we have um, an example of a backpack sling that you can use, you put your dog in it, and you can pack them out like a backpack. It's pretty important. So there's a blanket if you want to try making a makeshift one, and also bandaging Chug. She's really tolerant for it. You can do anything to her. But finally, I have uh, another person who works at the shelter, my friend Katie over here. Uh, and she has some guests along with us. And if you want a moment to go say hi, it wouldn't really be a visit from the Humane Society without some puppies or kittens. And she's got a couple kittens over there um, that you can go and visit with. Yeah. And outside, when you're all done, uh, yeah, um, our f other friend Katie has uh, the vet clinic set up at the Family First Station. Uh, so you guys can go and play around with her stuff, too. Pretty exciting. So thank you guys so much for listening. Um, don't forget, we have a big event on July 11th at Fort Missoula if you guys want to come and do some stuff with the Humane Society. We're also back open for ki uh, cat visits. So you guys can come and volunteer and pet some cats at the shelter. 
Uh, and if you guys have questions while you go around the stations, I'm going to be running around. You can ask me anything at any time. I release you. Thank you. A lot of kittens. Here's a big fluffy one. <laughs> Really? Is it in her house already? Yeah. Okay, so we have one more that didn't come with us that's still in the shelter. Okay. Which one should we pull out first? Do you guys want to visit? This one? Yeah. That one looks just like my Do you want to hold him? So all of these, so you just want to support his little butt. There you go. And if someone else wants to play with this. We've got a couple treats if someone wants to throw a treat in there. So all of these kittens are named after chili peppers, spicy peppers. So this one's Serrano. And then I think the other one's collars came off, but I believe they're jalapeno and ancho. They're a little tired. They've had a lot of socializing today. <laughs> All right, let's throw the sky back in there. Who wants to go next? Who do they want to visit with? I saw this hand first. Who would you like to hold? Um, yeah. Serrano. Come here. I need to go put Chug back at her station. She's so obedient. She stayed right where I left her. Quick surgery. You want to volunteer? Just come to the shelter. All right. Uh, do we actually get to keep it? Yeah, you do. Yeah. Okay. You'll go here, back. and then you can put it on like a backpack. There you go. You got a choke pack. I feel like you are heavy for a seven hand. No. No, you don't think so? No. For a stuffed animal, she's heavy. For a dog, she's really not very heavy. Pretty light. That's good. You could hike her right out of the woods. She broke her leg. You'd be like, no problem. We got you.